I've been around in this field for probably over 20 years doing integrative medicine and psychiatry. And um, I have classical training. I went to University of Toronto School of Medicine, uh, did my residency at uh, Cedar sinai internship at L.A. County. I did a rotating internship, so I learned a lot of heavy-duty medicine and have written a number of books. So uh, I come by all of this honestly, and I've dis just made my, all my own discoveries because when I started doing integrative medicine, it was new. Nobody else was doing it. So I was kind of... Um, First of all, a pioneer, but also I really had to forge my own path because we didn't have a functional forum. We didn't have, we had a few conferences, and I'm very grateful for the leaders, Abram Hoffer, Bill Walsh, um, Jeff Bland, and those are my mentors, and that's how it, I got into it. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is, first of all, what I do, how I approach patients as a psychiatrist, why I don't do the standard of care, which is just putting people on meds, to which people become addicted, and it becomes very difficult getting them off the medication. And James asked me tonight to really talk about how to gracefully and safely help people to get off of medication, and then how to actually maintain mental health once they get there. So how did I get here? Uh, first of all, I'm a doctor's kid, and I learned from my father the art of medicine. He had his office at home, and I was a little girl, and I answered the door. I'd see him do his practice, and I really got the sense of compassion and caring from him. So that was my first inspiration. Then when I went to County Hospital, I had a bit of a culture shock because I grew up in Toronto, went to the University of Toronto School of Medicine, and it was a very humane place. Then County was a bit of culture shock. And uh, I had to really depend on my roots, where I'd come from, about real caring and compassion. And that brought me into psychiatry. However, with psychiatry, I was doing a more psychoanalytically, psychodynamically oriented psychiatry. And more and more, it was becoming medication oriented. People were on pills, people were on antidepressants, antipsychotics. And it seemed to me that it wasn't really working very well, and there was less and less therapy being done by psychiatrists. And I think right now, most psychiatrists are pretty much just prescribing medications. So I was led to really see what was in front of me, which is people on medications with lots of side effects, not such good positive effects, a lot of people wanting to get off the meds. And so I really developed programs based on functional medicine for getting people off of the medications, onto natural therapies, and reclaiming their brain. That's what I do. So let me just go over some statistics. First of all, here's a very interesting study. 3,486 individuals aged 35 to 55, none of them were initially depressed. And in a five-year follow-up, based on their dietary patterns, the whole food people versus the processed food people had very, very different outcomes. And that is the processed food people were depressed. They were much more likely to develop depression and it's really clear to me. I mean, I know this. I see this every day. When you eat properly, when you eat whole foods that are feeding your brain, feeding your gut, feed, feel, feeding your whole body, that's when you have a healthy brain. Otherwise, you have symptoms called depression. Depression is not a condition. Depression and anxiety, and in fact, all the psychiatric issues that people have really are symptoms or symptoms of something's out of balance. And here's some depression statistics from the CDC. 26% of Americans 18 and older suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in any given year. That's huge. A quarter of Americans have a mental disorder. It's the leading cause of disability in the US and Canada. 
11% of Americans 12 and older are taking antidepressant medications. That's over 30 million. And it's increasing exponentially. And the highest group is women. 23% of women age 40 to 59 take an antidepressant, which is the highest of any group. And most of the time, it's a hormonal imbalance which needs to be addressed biochemically, not with medication. So what's the downside? The downside, the drugs are toxic. And in detoxifying them, in the body's processing them, it's using up nutrients. These are nutrients that we need to make our brain work properly. So the crazy thing is that we're giving something that's actually interfering with what it's supposed to be doing. Depleting our B vitamins, depleting zinc, depleting magnesium, depleting everything that we need to make the brain work properly. The reuptake inhibitors, the SSRI, actually accelerate the depletion of neurotransmitters. They don't make us have more serotonin, they make us have less. And th what happens too is the medications cause a down regulation of the neurotransmitter receptors by 40 to 60 percent. Also, these drugs are very addictive, very, very hard to discontinue. And uh, they change the brain. So you have a different brain after you've been on the SSRIs or any of the medications for a while. And so going off the medication is really hard because you're working with a different brain. And so ultimately, what could have been a short, time-limited depression or even psychotic episode or an anxiety episode or bipolar episode, what could be time limited ends up taking, uh, becoming a pro chronic condition. And the truth is that most episodes really would last only three to six months if they were left alone or treated minimally, not over treated. There may be times, I'm not anti-drug, I'm just saying that we need to use the drugs appropriately. So we may be turning short-term suffering into a long-term disability because we're changing the brain. And we know this from outcome studies. And besides, with all the increase of antidepressants, we're still having an increase in the incidence of depression. Well, what conclusion can you draw? Well, first of all, our environment's getting worse, but also it may be actually due to the use or overuse of antidepressant medication. And what we also know, we also know this from research that antidepressants are only slightly better than placebos, and they fail in the active placebo trials. So really the whole magic bullet idea of taking a pill for every ill, including specifically for depression or specifically for anxiety, doesn't really fly. Now for some people, some of the time, they may work. But as the way they're being prescribed now, not so much. And the side effects are terrible. I get these young women, I mean, this is so sad. I'll get women, you know, 18, 20, 25, who've gained an enormous amount of weight being on medication. And they feel terrible about themselves. Now, isn't that depressing? Uh, you get impairment of memory, GI disturbance. So just think about this. You actually are creating the leaky gut, which is causing more inflammation of the brain, which is making the condition worse. Headaches, insomnia, uh, birth defects, sexual dysfunction. Can you imagine you're on an antidepressant because you're, not, you're having problems with your relationship, you're depressed, and you end up with sexual dysfunction, men and women. And then some very, very sad outcomes, and that is suicide and homicide. Very much more common than we are led to believe. And many of these occur during withdrawal. And I've seen people, people have come to me, they've been sent to me withdrawing from a medication and feeling suicidal. So these are things that really have to be, uh, I, I think we need to educate psychiatrists and educate physicians. And I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to be addressing so many physicians and other healthcare practitioners about this because it's extremely important information. Um, these are not just harmless placebos. They're actually pretty dangerous. Um, and the stacking of meds can make it worse. People are on multiple medications, and they, we don't even know the interactions. And the truth is you need to be taken off drugs very, very slowly. Otherwise, what happens? Discontinuation syndrome. And with discontinuation syndrome, the person feels, 
worse than they did before they started the medication. They could have symptoms like brain zaps, and then their prescribing physician says, see, I told you you really need to be on the medication. And the truth is, no, you don't. You, we can actually take you off with the right supplements, the right treatment, and in fact, specifically for treating brain zaps, which are like electrical shocks in the brain, uh, the essential fatty acids work very, very well. So, and how, how do we take people off medication? It really varies case to case, but I'm just gonna give you some kind of rules of thumb. Uh, for example, with sertraline, Zoloft, you can go from 100 to 50 to 25 to 12.5 every seven to 14 days, or if that feels like too much and the individual can tell if it's feeling like it's too much of a jump, go down by 10% every seven to 14 days. And sometimes we need to compound it and that's okay. Get the liquid and then reduce even by 5%. Just, it took a long time to get into this quote addiction to the medication. So, or tolerance or whatever you want to call it. But so let's allow, let's respect the brain, give it some time to go off gradually. The payoff is worth it. Uh, the other thing is if you're on multiple medication, you have to be careful which ones to go off of first. Usually the last one first, or one that's giving you problems first. Um, benzos, even though they're the longest withdrawal, sometimes it's better to go off those first because the other medications will actually cover the symptoms. They'll take care of the, the symptoms because getting off of benzos is very, very difficult. And then what I'm really doing is working with nature, working with the body to produce neurotransmitters naturally. We have the best pharmacy inside of us and we need to add in the right ingredients. It's like baking a cake. You have to have the right ingredients. If you don't have the right ingredients, you're not gonna have the right end product. Uh, that being said, 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin, needs to be taken at least a couple of hours away from the SSRI medication to prevent um, to prevent serotonin syndrome. We also have to address issues of methylation. Now this is a very short address, so I'm just giving you some high, highlights. But these are all the things to consider when you're helping somebody to withdraw from medication and also just to go on a natural supplement program, even if they're not gonna be on medication, which is kind of the better way to go. Start, I mean, I love it when I get somebody brand new who said, I've been told to be on meds, I don't want to be, what do I do? And that's, that's the best, that's the best. So some of the nutrients, like baking this cake called neurotransmitters and call, called a healthy brain. For example, to make serotonin, we need tryptophan, which comes in the food supply, or we can supply tryptophan as a pill, as a capsule, or it, downstream it's 5-HTP. And in order to make those transitions from tryptophan to 5-HTP to serotonin, we need cofactors. We need zinc, we need B vitamins, we need magnesium, vitamin B6. And on the other side, we, we have dopamine going to, there's an error there actually, that it should be um, tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine to noradrenaline. And again, we need the cofactors. So tryptophan for serotonin, for the serotonin pathway, tyrosine for the dopamine and noradrenaline pathway. So here are some of the ingredients that I give. These are some of the supplements I give. 5-hydroxytryptophan, B6, tyrosine, B12, B3 or niacin. And Abram Hoffer had developed a very good program for schizophrenia using high doses of niacin very successfully. I use SAMe, which is also a good methyl donor, has adenosylmethionine. Folate and B12, particularly if people have methylation issues, and that's pretty common. I, I also do genetic testing. The omega-3 fish oils, which I mentioned earlier for brain zaps, but the omega-3 fish oils are so important for comprising the cell membrane, and they're anti-inflammatory, and they're, they have so many functions, they're also good for the heart. Magnesium, manganese, chromium, all of these are needed. We need B, D vitamin and 
even in Southern California where we have lots of sunshine, my patients need vitamin D. And sometimes genetically, people just don't, uh, the receptor sites for vitamin D are not, um, are not receptive, so you need to give extra vitamin D. So some people need even 10,000 units daily. Vitamin C, different herbal products, lifestyle factors like exercise, diet, and sleep, which we talk about all the time here on Functional Forum, and light therapy, acupuncture, neurofeedback. I love neurofeedback because you teach the brain to self-regulate. We need probiotics, we need to take care of the gut. And very often we use combination products. I've put some together myself because it's hard for people to be opening up 20 bottles, you know, so it's good to have access to combination products for specific conditions. And I, I would be remiss not to mention the gut-brain connection. I'm certainly not going to give a whole lecture on that, but you know, 90% of the cells in our body are bacteria. And the truth is that 90, up to 99% of our DNA is actually bacterial. It's not our DNA, it's our bug's DNA. And the vagus nerve is actually the pathway that, through which the gut, the microbiome, connects to the brain. So we have the central nervous system with the brain and spinal cord and the enteric or autonomic nervous system. So it's a very interesting system. We're getting to know more and more and more about how the gut actually controls the brain. Very, very important. So a very good article, lead article in psychology today, Can Yogurt Cure Depression? Isn't that cool? And it was about a group of women that were given uh, yogurt. And this wasn't, it wasn't even you know, capsules of probiotic, but they were given yogurt. And it really affected their mood. And what we also know is that different strains of probiotics can actually produce different neurotransmitters and produce different mood effects. For anxiety, we have GABA-producing probiotics. For depression, we have serotonin-producing probiotics and ones that affect cortisol. So these, these bugs in us, are, they're our friends, and we actually are learning more and more how to utilize them clinically. Uh, gluten sensitivity, huge. Um, for schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, bipolar illness, cognitive problems, we must look at gluten sensitivity. And that's just one of the many sensitivities, and often this cross sensitivity with dairy as well. So I have people go on an elimination diet. There's also, of course, lab testing that we can do. So that it's extremely important to have patients be compliant about this, to at least be willing to go on an elimination diet. So uh, in summary, I just want to say, points to ponder. Depression is not a Prozac deficiency. Anxiety is not a benzodiazepine deficiency. Advice, live, eat, and supplement well. Feed your microbiome, be good to your bugs, and balance your brain. And aging isn't optional, but brain aging can be. So I want to thank you for listening. And I have a gift for all of you. If you go to my website, casmd.com, you can get a free e-report called Reclaim Your Brain, where I recap a lot of this information. And these are some of the books that I've written. They're also available on my website. So thank you.